I've called it the run-up this morning because uh, I'm going to share with you, uh, and I trust that you just graciously listen to me, and you're able to glean, you're able to, to pick up uh, some of the things that I would uh, highlight for you out of Nehemiah. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long while since I've been in this part of God's Word, but I, I did actually track down my notes from 1997, uh, and they didn't make a lot of sense, which doesn't surprise me, uh, because we're always coming in a new space as far as our relationship with the Lord is concerned, and it's good to just be uh, learning and engaging afresh. So we've come to this inspiring man uh, called uh, Nehemiah, and I have uh, made provision, and I'm trusting that you're able to, to actually read the context. You don't have to read it out loud like Don did. Uh, just read it, ideally in a modern translation, because it's just a little bit easier maybe to get the, the flow of the picture, because we're wanting to get the picture more than maybe the logistics or the details that would have had a whole lot more sort of relevance in the context in which it uh, first happened. And talking about uh, context, uh, this, is, this is our theme, as, uh, as Marlene mentioned, all hands on deck. What a great little illustration. Was that actually Alan in that photo? You changed the colour of your... you got hair dye or something now, Alan. More, more of it. Now or then? Oh, good. Just, that's unusual to actually go the other way, but I thought, you know, these things happen. Uh, but, yeah, that looked pretty trendy, you know? Did you, did you realise you had to level up the wrong way? But that's beside the point. Um, but it's a great little illustration. So we've got a couple of really good link points in our, in our uh, service this morning. And hopefully when you come along on a Sunday morning, you can start to do a little bit of this connecting. Because we don't just come along and do church. We come along to see things connecting in the God picture. And hopefully there's more and more detail. And you'll see a picture one day that goes up on, maybe not up on the screen, but on the screen of your mind and your heart. And you'll say, that's my name. I'm in that. Because that's what he wants. He wants my name. Well done, Don. All those names. You know, all those names had significance at that time because they were individuals. They were individuals putting their hand up and saying, I'll be in that project. And that's, uh, that, again, it is in every generation that the Lord's looking out across the, the span of his people, the gathering of his people and saying, you want to be in? You want to be in? And this, this is very much what Nehemiah is about. Now, just to see how well connected we are. See, see that 592 BC, a couple of maths teachers here. How long ago was that? A long time ago. That's all we need to know for now. But I was fascinated when I picked up Nehemiah again and I couldn't find it. I figured it must be near the end. You're probably thinking, why couldn't he find it? That's because you're quick thinkers and you're looking for little things to latch onto. But you look for Nehemiah and you actually find him almost in the middle of the Old Testament. How come when he's actually, timeline is at the end? Now this is significant only when we start to see the flow of time in God's plan. But I put that up there so that you and I, maybe people who have often turning over the pages of God's word. You can see some of the names that are there. You can see those, those, those people that you've heard of, Ezekiel, Daniel, Obadiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. You can see down the other side there in white, which I said to somebody last night, please don't put white on light blue because it's hard to read. But what it says down that left-hand side that you can see there is Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah. Now, for those who love to visit Esther, you can now see the context in history that she was as well. Uh, now, I, hopefully that's, uh, um, for those who have read, hopefully that makes a, a whole lot more sense. Now, I make that focus because a passage that, uh, again, has probably been moved around in our minds and hearts quite frequently is this one. Now, this is, this is Timothy. Uh, okay, this is 2 Timothy. And a passage we know well, often used by the Bible Society, remind us to read our Bibles. But it is also a reference to these pages that we turn over 
and that we sort of think, I don't know, well, there's all those names in there, that can't be all that relevant. But we're turning over these pages and we're looking, we're looking for the, the relevance. We're looking for the way in which we see the hand of God. And as a result of seeing the hand of God, we have an anticipation. We're able to look and then see the hand of God in my generation. Because that's the way that God works. He wants us to see. He wants us to be a part of it. So I go through the book of Nehemiah. And I hope you do as well. I hope you go through and feel some sharp edges. I, I woke this morning, as I often do on a Sunday morning. It's good that I wake up. Um, and um, I turn the telly on to watch It Is Written, <clears throat> simply because it's left on the same station that Escape to the Country was on last night. So it's easy. But the, the, uh, James, no, was it? Pastor Rachel. Uh, was, was uh, emphasizing or focusing on Psalm 23. Great comfort. Very, very comforting. But not all of the Old Testament is comforting. Some of it is designed to have a sharp edge so that we feel that edge, that, that sword that's got the sharp edge. And so when we turn to the book of Nehemiah and the history of that time, we can genuinely anticipate that um, there'll be a little bit of a... Ooh, Let's uh, feel that. What, what was that? An edge. Sharp edge that uh, creates a consciousness of something that's, that's just happened. So we're, we're looking at Nehemiah and appreciating that, yes, time has passed. Uh, time always tends to pass. I, I thought I'd try a little exercise this morning. I don't normally bring my mobile phone into church. But I, I bring it uh, because it helps me to find my mask later on. Um, and so there you go. I take a note of the time. I've just noted the time. If you want to check your mobile, it's 10.38. I'll keep an eye on that because I've never done that before. Apparently it can be helpful if you've got an idea of where time's going. I'm sure most of us are time conscious. But if I picked up on the fact that my life journey as it unfolds with its measure of days and hours, how much is the level of eternity imposing itself on my life? How much am I aware of eternal, eternity? So, do you understand my question there? Because, you know, it's really easy, really easy to do double time in our earthly journey and hit the box at the end, and we've missed eternity. We've missed the taste. We've missed the entry. We've missed the, the fullness, the, the, the working out of this eternal relationship with God. Do you think that's a bit edgy? Is it a bit sharp? Well, it's what Nehemiah was working with. This consciousness of a relationship with an eternal God who's made a relationship with people and he's saying, I want the project that I have for you to be restored. I, 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 want, I want to have a people who are shaped the way that I want to shape them. Hopefully you can catch on to where I'm traveling with some of these things and hopefully you can pick up some of the little edgy bits so that we can be working with those sharp bits. It's important to comfort one another. It's important to encourage one another. But sometimes there are sharp bits, there are edgy bits that we've got to think about, that we've got to um, confront, be confronted by. So before I go too far along that track, back to my TV viewing. I do enjoy grand designs. Anybody else enjoy grand designs? Oh, while you've got your hands up, how many of you have read Nehemiah 3 this week? Good. Not as many as watch Grand Designs. Can I encourage you to put that the other way around? The full value of any gathering of God's people is preparation. It's a beautiful illustration that comes out of the Old Testament. You know, there was a huge amount of preparation for any gathering of God's people in the Old Testament. Huge amount of preparation. It wasn't just a matter of everybody rock up at whatever particular time on a particular day. There was preparation, extensive preparation. There was journeying. There was consciousness of what they were doing. And we'll see what God does when God's people are actually prepared to meet him. 
Not just in this context, but every time I step up in the morning. Say, Lord, I'm preparing. I'm preparing to meet you in this day. Anyway, my grand designs illustration. It's really fascinating. Not just the building side. I just love anything that's got building in it. All that sort of stuff. But it's so, so fun to watch. You know, these people that have got a vision, people got an idea, people got something that they've dreamed of in the way of this building or the location or whatever it is, and they set about and there's an architect there and they've got all their, got everything in place and they've got resources and then they haven't got resources and then they have health issues and then something happens in the family and just, it's all true to life, isn't it? It's, it's not a make-up thing, but the thing that really draws me to a screaming halt is that after 52 minutes, they sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk about how the building project went. But it's interesting, for those who have read a little bit ahead, the Nehemiah project that he had, how long did it take him? He's part of the project. 52 minutes, uh, 52 days. So now when I'm watching Grand Designs, I'm thinking Nehemiah. And I'm thinking, my part in the project. What's my part in the project? Let's ring up. Let's ring up Alan Hitchcock, Hitchcock and see how it works. How did he get an orthopedic surgeon to be working on his fence? You'd have to be careful, wouldn't you? You don't want to break any one of those fingers. You know, it's all right. He was, he was more... Oh, you were more concerned than him. Yeah. Good on you. But anyway, in on the project. And this fellow, uh, Nehemiah, is, um, I don't know if he's an orthopedic surgeon, but he's certainly working with stuff. Now, two weeks ago, I shared this with you. And this is what I want to encourage you to do as well. All right? Now, this is not the final script. This is what you have to believe out of this passage. This is what every Christian needs to take on board to be a genuine follower of Jesus. I'm not saying that. Engage the word and see what it says to you. Okay? So here's what I discovered in those first two chapters. And I, I mentioned to you before, I'm on the run up. You know, I'm going back to my Alan Hitchcock's because it just so happened we're talking coffee and somebody talked about Alan playing cricket many years ago and how he used to trundle in and all that sort of stuff. Long run up, wasn't it, Alan? Must have been 250 metres he used to run in before he bowled the ball. But the, the, the run-up on this occasion is just to bring us all to the same point in this narrative so that together we can engage the next couple of pages and see what's relevant there. Here's what I believe that uh, is significant for me and, and I found in the testimony of the Word. Nehemiah was very conscious of his location in life. Knew exactly where he was. All right? Simplify that. I'll go on to the next point. All right? He knew his circle of influence. I once read an article that says basically every person who travels the, the, the earthly journey influences up to 3,000 people. You know, it's not, it's not because you have some place of authority or whatever. Just by meeting a person, just by waving to a person, you can influence them. All right? That's why a few generations back, Jesus' followers were encouraged to say, smile at somebody. You don't have to say Jesus loves you, just pray it. You know, you can actually influence a person by a gesture, by the facial expression. But Nehemiah knew his circle of influence. He knew also the condition of the community of faith that he was a part of. Huh? And that was part of, that was part of the burden that sat on his heart. There was a burden for God's people. And, and, and he, was, he was genuinely feeling that. He was grieved by that. He was, it was emotionally demanding. It, was, it got on his mind. And he was, as a result of that, he took his condition, this weight, he took it, into his relationship with God and you can see by his conversations with God the nature of the weight that he was carrying, the intensity of the weight that he was carrying. This is why I value people being in the same prayer context as I am. 
Not so as we can hear how many words we can pray, but you can hear a person's heart. You know, we're not, here to, we're not there to hear gossip. We're not there to fall asleep. We're there to actually engage our relationship with God in such a way that it's very clear what my heart is feeling. And you would have heard this morning as Marlene shared with her, what's her heart? Her heart is mission. And it translates, it influences us as a people of faith. We're a fellowship very much drawn into mission. And we're very generous and supportive of mission. That's how it's meant to work amongst the people of God. The other thing that Nehemiah did, and it's not always something that we're prepared to do, Nehemiah said, I own our history. It's not a matter of somebody over there is responsible for our history. That person needs to do that. Those people need to come in line with what I think. There was nothing of that in Nehemiah. He said, I own our history. I have contributed to our history. And at that particular time, their history was not a pretty one. It was fragmented. It was, it, was, it was people going all over the place, apart from into the space of their relationship with God. And so Nehemiah had all these things happening inside of him. And then we see this, this beautiful situation, and believe it or not, i am just got to the end of chapter 1. So you'll be pleased to know when we get to chapter 3, I'm finished. But Nehemiah was looking for the favour, for favour with God. He was looking for mercy from the king of that time and he was looking for favour with God. Seek the grace of God. So that's where we got to a fortnight ago. And this was the prayer that I finished with. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. Nehemiah sought the grace of of God. It's something you and I have been reminded of this morning that we can earnestly do as well. Seek to know every measure of the grace of God. I celebrated this morning the grace of God in the Lord's Supper. I celebrated this morning by listening to Marlene as she reminded me that my earthly vessel is the dwelling place of the grace of God the Spirit of God. I've been reminded through that colourful song that appeared on the screen that the Spirit of God has brought with him his toolbox. He has brought with him a gift, a gift that's specifically designed to take shape in my life and bring blessing into the world of others and be edifying, be stirring, be stimulating, be motivational in my faith as well. Wow, there we go. Okay, I've got this up there to remind me. It's now 12 minutes later. It was just a few short months after Nehemiah had prayed that prayer recorded in chapter 1, verse 11. It was just a few months later that uh, Nehemiah was in Jerusalem. The place he, his heart was so much grieving for, the people, the population, the context, the, what that city meant for him and his relationship with God and the, the, the people's relationship with God. He was, he was in that place. And he was meeting with a group of people that you could say they had a common heart, but I'm sure not all of them carried the intensity that, that Nehemiah did. But he's meeting with them. And, 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 he, and he's, he's getting, uh, as, a, as it were, he's, he's, he hits the ground, if you can use the term, he hits the ground running. He's not there very long and he's already around the city looking, saying, what is the dimensions of this particular project? How big is it? What do we have to do? Where are the resources that, we, that he knew he had access to resources? By the grace of God. And he does, draws this 
picture, it gathers the, it gathers the picture. Now, to give you an idea, now I'll check with my scholars here. Who's scholaring here? This way, Grant's here, Grant's here, good. Just a uh, question without notice, Grant. No, don't bother. The project is that Nehemiah is going with is to, as it were, restore the walls of Jerusalem. You think, oh yeah, that's a simple project. No, it's more than a building project. His project is, is about not so much the city. The city is crucial. It is very much the heart of God's people. There's no doubt about it. It's a bit like the church. It's a, it's a bit like the church. But the walls are walls. It's about the definition of the heart of God's people. It's about definition, knowing who they were, where they were centered, what they were on about, who they wanted to please, if I can put it that way, hopefully. Anyway, I've calculated, estimated by my reading, and obviously sometimes you can pick up different commentaries and you get different numbers. So apparently it's about seven and a half kilometers of wall to restore. Anybody done brickwork recently? Seven and a half kilometers brickwork? It's a reasonable project. But in the midst of that, there's towers, there's, there's gates, there's doors. It's, it's not as, you know, as much as Alan's got those skills. I'm not too sure how he'd go with a seven and a half kilometers of fence. But there it is. That's, that's the nature of the project. And as I say, it's not just a, it's not just a physical project. It, it's actually something about the defining of the people. And I can ask a question now. How, how would you define the church? It's an open-ended question. I don't want to answer now, but just, just think about it. How would you define, actually, this, this collection of God's people that own the name of Jesus? Just a little question exercise to go with. But I've got to move on with Nehemiah. And, and, and just, just the way in which Nehemiah... He's, he's on the ground, he, he's, he's on to finding out what the picture is, and it's a quite a sizable project, and there's a few people traveling with him, just a small group to begin with, just getting a picture of the whole thing. And then he starts to talk with other people about the nature of the project. And, and, he's, and, and he's able to communicate accurately uh, the picture. And, and here's a bit of an idea. Uh, again, we're going backwards to some extent, in, in uh, Nehemiah, but I'll read it out for you. Then I said to them, this is that group of people that are starting to gather around him and own that sense of this is the project we are, we are moving into. You see the trouble we are in, says Nehemiah, how Jerusalem lies in ruin with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. You can see it's not just about the the wall, it's, it's about who they are as a people. Huh? And I told them of the hand of God that had been upon me for good. He, tell, he shares his testimony as to how he got to this point and how God just touched the heart of King Artaxerxes and every provisions made for him to move ahead with this project. And uh, also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. That's inspiring leaders. Yeah. This, this, this individual, this, this Nehemiah, gifted in that leadership quality. We also realize that as much as all these things are happening for Nehemiah and this group of people, there is this realization that the project is really a challenging one. And he knows that not everybody's going to go with it. And there are going to be some people who maybe hinder the progress of the project. But he's committed. This group is committed. So, here we go. The run-up's nearly finished, and I'm nearly finished for this morning. Just let me check. Hang on. 10.56. Yeah, right. Things to notice, and I, this is what I'm encouraging you to do as well. Reading through this, it's not a Bible study. It's not a question that I'm going to give you 10 questions next week, and those that pass will go on to the next level or whatever. It's about engaging the word and, and just really letting what's happening strike you. Here's the things that I believe. 
have gathered now uh, in this aspect of the run-up. Nehemiah's moving in the grace of God. Now, I use that term, moving in the grace of God. Does that sit well with you? I, I, I might have had this picture that the Old Testament, you don't find a lot of the grace of God. Let me tell you, it is peppered with the grace of God. And Nehemiah knows what it means to experience the grace of God and move in it. And here's where I come back, that little, that little side prompt. We've been reminded this morning, the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit of God has brought with him gifts that have this grace flavour, this grace quality, and he wants them to work in you. And now it is that we might be with that, like that group that sat with Nehemiah and said, yep, I'm in that. I'll do that. I'll be a part of the project by the grace of God because he's made every provision. So Nehemiah is moving in the grace of God. He's got a realistic picture of the project. He has walked around the walls, seven and a half kilometres thereof, or whatever exactly it was. He has had this, uh, this wonderful opportunity to draw the picture for other people clearly in such a way that they can appreciate, hey, this is the nature of the project that we're moving into. The next thing that I would, I would observe about uh, Nehemiah is that he has stirred the hearts of people in such a way that they are prepared to invest. They're prepared to go for it. They strengthened their hand and said, we'll be in the project. And then Nehemiah, conscious of the resistance that's going to come, he is prepared uh, to speak with precision to those who would oppose the project. And this is what he says to them. He replied to those who were choosing not to be a part of the project and in actual fact would come quite consciously, to be a hindrance to the project. He says, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Head on. So there's the run-up. And believe it or not, that's where I finished this morning. Because I want you to read ahead. I want you to read ahead the next couple of chapters. Won't take long. Uh, unless, of course, you try to pronounce all the names. Just, you know, one of those things, probably some of you have been trained along the line. If you see a word that you can't quite pronounce, just say wheelbarrow. Alan will understand wheelbarrow. Knows all about wheelbarrows. But you get the drift. Look at the picture. What's happening? What's God doing? What's God doing in that individual? What's he going to do in these people? What happens when this and things change around? Because it is the reality that we're dealing with. And I have to say that Nehemiah is probably the most relevant match, as far as a project is concerned, to the very context in which we find ourselves today as the Christian community. You have a look at it, and you just think about, it. oh, the Christian community that I'm a part of. Are there parallels here? And then we'll get to that point and we'll, we'll discover what's the Lord putting on my heart? What's the weight that he's putting there that I can intercede with intensity and with perspiration? That I, I'm not looking for the comfort lane. I'm looking for my part in the project. I conclude. This very familiar passage and, and I bring it to you uh, conscious that this is in many ways a starting point of any person's relationship with Jesus just know that this is how it sits Ephesians 2 reads like this for it is by grace you have been saved right a little testimony in my spirit that says yeah that's me I know the grace of God by faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. 
not by works, so that no one can boast with their human talents and skills and education and intellect or whatever. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do the good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I hope it happens. That's a very flippant statement, isn't it? But I do. My hope is built on nothing less, on no one else than Jesus and the total investment he's made. That's an adaptation of the hymn that we're going to sing as we conclude our gathering. But I encourage you, engage the word, experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your own life and see how hope rises in you. And as the word says, that hope does not disappoint because it's centred in the one who says, I will build my people gathered. Amen? Amen.